Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Glad to have y'all here with us this morning at Bethany. Um, I don't know. I didn't think of anything to say today. So let's just stand up and just start with a little bit of worship, shall we?
Christy Hammock, the communication specialist here at our church. Thank you for choosing to include worship at Bethany today. If you are a first time guest with us today, or maybe it's been a while since you've been here, we want to give you a very special welcome. At Bethany, you'll find a family of faith where you can grow spiritually and find a place to serve as a blessing to the Lord and to our community. You are both welcomed and wanted here. No matter if you're a follower of Christ, seeking a church home, or maybe a person that's just searching for some answers. Welcome. We have a special gift bag for you in the back. Just fill out that connection card that's in front of you, hand it to one of the ladies in the back, and we want to just celebrate you being here. We don't pass an offering plate here, but we do have giving boxes at all of our doors. We are so thankful for the faithful giving that you share with us weekly. We have some exciting news. We are starting a new small group here. This class will be led by Jason Bussey and Mark Hodges and their wives. The target group for this class would be those newly married or past the college age and into the mid-30s. This allows another group to form based on their stages of what life is happening. It will start April 28th with the fellowship. If you want more information, find me after service. There is a QR code in front of you that leads to all things Bethany's. So you can download our app, give online, see events, and student parents will find the info for camp. Scan that and check it out today. This week, Triple L meets Tuesday at 11. They will have a program and then enjoy some lunch together. This crowd is living longer and loving it. Men, you've been invited to join with Hayhire First Baptist for a wild game dinner. If you want to attend, it's April 27th at 5 p.m. May 5th, we'll have an informational meeting about VBS immediately following service. If this is something you're interested in, stay for a few minutes after the service for that meeting. Thank you all for supporting our students the way you do. Last week's auction and dinner was a success. We have one last but not least fundraiser that you can check out. Grab tickets for the next two weeks and we'll draw the winner on April 28th. Spring break has come and gone and summer is on the horizon. The school year is winding down and summer is gearing up. We may have even passed all of our cold snaps for the year and on to the dreaded heat. Whatever you're dealing with and whatever season you're currently sitting in, please know you're both welcome and wanted here at Bethany. Thanks for coming, have a great service, and let's stand for a little more worship.
you to grab it please find the old testament book of joel the old testament book of joel i I love hearing uh, from this perspective up here folks grabbing their bible and turning their pages it's uh it's it's refreshing to hear this morning we're kicking off a brand new sermon series over the next four weeks and so if you want to put your ribbon there old testament small book four uh four chapters we're going to be camping there over the next few weeks Hey, so while you're turning there, um, a couple of reminders. Uh, Just uh, learned a few minutes ago to pray for uh, Brittany Holder. If you know Brittany and Michael, they joined the church here a few minutes ago. Her dad is having an emergency appendectomy. I I learned that that is, uh, I'm not smarter than I appear, trust me, Uh, but um, that is an emergency appendix surgery, and so just pray for him. I had no idea. I said, now what is an appendectomy? Um, So pray for him. Uh, Also learn that uh, uh, Ramsey and Sawyer will be bringing home their new baby boy today uh, from the hospital, and so we are excited for them. Certainly be uh, in prayer for them. Um, a lot happening here at the church. I know that there are other prayer requests and things that, that we could share, but uh, just want to encourage you to be 
uh, in prayer for those um, specifically. Hey, so uh, today we're, uh, we're kicking off this sermon series to the book of Joel. So Joel is what we call a minor prophet, not because their message is minor, but what makes the, the book a minor prophet is the fact that it's not as long as some of the others as far as like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And so... Um, Again, I just encourage you to take your ribbon or put your bookmark there because this is where we're going to be over the next four Sundays. You know, we don't know a great deal about Joel. I told somebody this weekend, I was kicking off a sermon series about the book of Joel, and they said that very thing. You know, I don't know a whole lot about Joel. And, and truth be told, none of us really do. We know that his name, Joel, means Jehovah is God. Uh, we don't know really who he is. We don't know really where he lived. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about when he lived as far as that goes, or really a whole lot we can, we can make some connections based upon uh, some study and history and some of the groups that he mentions in his letter as far as where he preached, but we don't know the specifics even. All we have is this brief little book in the Bible, and then uh, he suddenly appears on the scene delivering God's message and then disappears out. And that's exactly what Joel does throughout uh, the three chapters of this prophecy. And so today, uh, we're going to begin in Joel chapter 1. And so uh, if you want to make your way there, Joel 1. And we're going to uh, be looking at Joel chapter 1 and into Joel chapter uh, 2. And we're going to be looking at what real repentance looks like, what real repentance looks like. So if you have your place, if you are able, I'd like to invite you to stand with me to honor the reading of God's perfect, infallible, and holy word. And we're going to be bouncing around uh, a little bit. You'll catch on to this. We're going to be looking at 1 through 4 and then verse 10 and then jumping down 13 through 15 and then a few verses out of chapter 2. Joel chapter 1, the word of the Lord reads as follows. The word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of, here we go, Bethlehemuel, no, Pethen, Pethen, Pethuel, yeah, Pethuel. Amber's helping me because I said, hey, I've got a word that I've got a name. They couldn't name people regular names in biblical times. I don't get it. Like, give the, give the dude a, re a real name. But anyway, so, uh, so Amber was helping me because I said, this one is a mouth full, Pethuel, hear this, you elders, and listen, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days, in our father's days, or in our father's days? Tell your son about it, and have your sons tell their sons, and their sons the next generation. What the gnawing locusts have left, the swarming locusts have eaten. And what the swarming locusts have left, the creeping locusts have eaten. And what the creeping locusts have left, the stripping, stripping locusts have eaten. The field is ruined, verse 10. The field is ruined, the land mourns, the grain is ruined, the new wine is dried up, the fresh oil has failed, verse 13. Put on sackcloth and mourn, you priest. Wail, you ministers at the, at the altar. Come, spend night in sackcloth, you ministers of God. For grain offering and drink offering have been withheld from the house of God. Verse 14, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the elders of all the inhabitants of the land of the house of the Lord and cry out to the Lord. 15, woe to the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Blow a trumpet in Zion. I believe this is uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion and a sound an alarm on the holy mountains. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Indeed, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom and a day of clouds and thick darkness. As dawn of the spread of the mountains, so... There is a great and mighty people. There have, been, there have never been anything like this, nor will there be again after years of many generations. Verse 10, Before the earthquakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon and the darkness, and the stars lose their brightness. The Lord utters His voice before His army. His camp is indeed very great, for many is one who carries out His word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome, and who can endure it? Yet now, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and mourning. 
tears in your heart, not merely tearing your heart, tearing your heart, not merely your garment. Now return to the Lord, for He is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger, abounding in mercy and relenting in catastrophe. Who knows, He might turn the relent and leave a blessing behind, resulting in a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, I know that this is going to be a turf, tough word this morning. But Lord, I know that even in the midst of some of the more difficult passages of Scripture, Lord, you meet us there. I pray you do that here this morning as we embark on this journey over the next four weeks. Lord, I pray you would help us to leave here equipped to walk a better life for your glory and your honor. Lord, I pray for those that we mentioned this morning. Lord, I pray for the Holder family. I pray for Brittany's dad, Lord, that you would just touch him with the surgeons and the team that are working with him, that, Lord, you would be gracious, that you would lead and guide their hands. Lord, for Holly and Ramsey, uh, Lord, as they come home, bring in a new baby boy home, that, Lord, you would be gracious to them. And, Lord, we just pray at a young age that this child would come to know you personally as Savior and Lord and live a life bringing honor and glory to your name. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. So this morning, I I kind of alluded to this already, but this morning, we are going to be talking about real repentance. And and I don't know if you're like me, when you hear that, uh, when somebody says real repentance, that, that brings to mind a question, or at least it does in my mind, and that is, if there is such a thing as real repentance, then does that mean that there is such a thing as false repentance? Uh, Like there are people who know how to fake it, right? People who know how to pretend like they're good with God when they really aren't. Uh, How do you spot a fake? How do you know what is real and what is not? A couple of stories comes to mind. Uh, A few years ago, uh, Melissa and I were, um, were traveling. I don't remember. I think we were traveling to Florida and uh, we come across one of those big, uh, like, like flea markets, like peddler markets along the side of the interstate. And I'll never forget, we stopped, and it was just like, hey, it was one of those, we're leisure, on vacation, I've never been this guy, but I'm like, hey, this looks cool, let's stop, we can't check into the room until like 3 o'clock, and we left at like 8 o'clock in the morning, it's not that far of a drive, right? So we stop, and we pull in, and we get to walking through there, and Melissa's like, Holy cow, they've got MK purses over there. She's all into the Michael Core purses. And so she's like, man, they've got Michael Core purses over there. She's like, I need to go over there. I need a new purse. And she comes over and she says, you're not going to believe this. They're selling this MK purse that I just saw like the other day for like $500. They're selling it for like 50 bucks. And it's new. And I'm like, are you for real? And she's like, yeah. So she's like, come here, look. She said, I just literally looked at this little like... Now, forgive me, ladies, I don't know the lingo. I mean, it's like over-the-shoulder bags, like purse things. I don't cro- Crossovers? Is that what those are called? I, get, cro- I got an A, a crossover. All right. So, um, guys, it pays to pay attention. Uh, but anyway, they were, so she was like, I just looked at this crossover. It was like $275, and it's like 40 bucks. And I'm like, are you for real? And she, yeah, and I walk over, and the same guy's got Rolexes over here now, got Rolexes for 40 bucks and I'm going hey something is wrong (laughs) something is wrong at first I thought I've been lied to my whole life I know that the mall marks stuff up but dang that is horrible right there but the more I got to looking at it it's like you know no that's like back in the day you know you had your Oakley's and then you had your fake lease (laughs) <laughs> right. Uh, so, so this was the deal. They were they were fakes with that name on them, and they, I mean, you know, they looked pretty real. They looked authentic. You had to kind of know the difference. You know, it's like the MK purses, but you look on the inside, and where it says MK all on the inside and says authentic, it says made in Taiwan or something. But it, but anyway, uh, well, wh- why is that such a big deal? And I think that goes along with our repentance and how we can perceive things to be a certain way when in all actuality they're not. I'll never forget Breeze a few years ago. Our daughter um, had an opportunity to go on a field trip to New York. 
And, and it was such a big thing, like, you know, they were going on New York, it was a chaperone trip, but literally Breeze is over there FaceTiming with Melissa. Melissa wants to go to New York. She always says uh, for the food, but, um, but she wants to go check out New York. And our daughter's over there like FaceTiming, like, look at the buildings. And everywhere there were people that had things for sale, and it was the same way. They have like Michael Kor purses and coach bags and all this for dollars of what they were in the store. And they were fake. They were pennies of what they were in the store. And, and all of these brand names were fake. And, and, and at the moment, I couldn't tell that they were, but I just knew that they were based upon the expense. And some of these things look like good knockoffs, and at the end, they're fake. And the sad reality is, church, I'm convinced that there are many among the church, many among the people of God today, that we have a lot of fake repentance. It looks genuine. It looks genuine as far as on the outside, right? Everything looks legitimate. But deep within, it's simply not real. And I want us to take some time this morning and look at the prophet Joel and what he says about real repentance. And so we put a sheet in there. If you want to take some notes, that's great. If not, I understand that too. But, but I think Joel begins to take an honest look at the situation. And I believe that that's where genuine repentance begins. Genuine repentance begins with a heavy dose of reality. When we begin to look at the real situation, and that's where we have to start. For some people, they simply, re- to, they simply refuse to acknowledge what is real. I, I can't remember, I, I can remember when our kids were little, I'll never forget this, but when our kids were little and they would do something wrong, we would look at them and say, well, now you need to apologize, and, and, and you'd get one of these through the eye roll like, okay, I'm sorry. You know? And it's like, that's not real, you know? So, you know, it just wasn't good enough. So we'd have them come back, and, and say, I was wrong for blank, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? How many times do we just walk through life like, you know, I'm sorry, because it's simple, but it doesn't really acknowledge what's going on with the current situation. Well, Joel is about to give a master's class on repentance. And I would say that it's important for us to pay attention and maybe even take a few notes because If you follow Jesus for any length of time, I can almost promise you that maybe not right now, but at some point in time in your life and in your walk with the Lord, you have faced moments in your life when repentance wasn't real. Here's a scene. Think about this. Joel gets up one morning. He goes out. He gets the morning paper. When he opens up the morning paper, he looks at the headline and it says, Locusts are coming, right? Economical devastation is near, and like any good preacher, Joel wasn't going to waste an opportunity for a good lesson, and so he used the devastation of locusts to point to a day when the judgment of God would come and would, de- would be devastatingly brutal in form. Any, like any good preacher, Joel used this inv- in, inv- in, pfft, investation, excuse me guys, of locusts to direct our day to the coming of the Lord. Uh, We read these verses a minute ago. Joel said in Joel chapter 1 that the word of the Lord came to Joel, who was this guy's son, Bethlehem, nope, Bethlehem, yeah, anyway. Here's this, he says, you elders and, and, and listen, all inhabitants of the land, has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? And then he says, hey, here's what I want you to do. Go tell your sons and have your sons tell their sons and their sons the next generation. What is he saying? He's saying, hey, I don't want you to forget about this, right? He says, I want you to remember this. Tell your sons about it and have their sons. What the gnawing locusts have left, the swarming locusts have eaten, and what the swarming locusts have left, the creeping locusts have eaten, and what the creeping locusts have left, the stripping locusts have eaten. See, we get this um, idea from these verses, kind of the life cycle of, a, of an invasion of locusts. Locust is a, is a kind of grasshopper-like feature, uh, creature. Uh, the female locust is about three inches in length, and the female locust deposits about 75,000 eggs in one square meter of soil. 
And so it takes 14 to 16 days to, for the life cycle to, uh, for the, the locusts to hatch. And then when they do hatch, man, the dust suddenly comes alive and the earth begins to tremble as the locusts march forward. Some say that they, they go as many as 400 to 600 feet a day. So they don't go very far, but when they do, it's a major deal, and nothing seems like it's able to stop them as they go. And, and, and they go just across the field and devastate everything in their path. They strip the fields, they strip the plants, they strip the leaves off of the tree, they even strip the bark off of the tree. And when they hit the water, the first group to make it to the water drowned because they're not able to swim. But then when the next group comes behind them, they're crawling over the dead locust to continue to move forward. And at a certain point, then the locusts sprout wings. And they begin to fly, and they darken the skies. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of that, but it's literally like they darken the skies. These locusts are swarming through the air. And they say it's like the, the noise of a, of a jet airplane because of the, uh, the wings and the crunching jaws, and everything in their pathway then is destroyed. The only hope is for some great wind to come along and sweep them out to sea so that they drowned. And so this plague, this usually takes four to six days for the locusts to pass through the land. And when they do, literally the devastation almost looks snow white. Everything is stripped bare, this bleached, utter devastation. And this was just the picture that the preacher Joel kind of needed to declare a message to God's people and to call people's, God's people back to him. Joel wanted the people of Judah to understand that what God was saying to them through, he wanted them to understand what God was saying to them through this plague. And as their nation, or as our nation, faces multiple catastrophes and disasters, I think we have to ask, what is God saying to us? What is the message that God might be giving to us? Because Joel wrote so that the people would know that God was saying that, hey, these are critical events. These are things that are happening. Notice what God is trying to do. God is trying to use an insect to get the attention of his people. God can use something insignificant, something small. And what are some things that God might be using today? One of the things that people watch very carefully is the stock market, right? Uh, there are people that, that watch that thing like a hawk. What if tomorrow we got up and it went down a thousand points? What would happen to our country? Just a few numbers on a board could get the attention of a nation, wouldn't it? Just, just, just the little things, just a, a few economical indicators could, cost, could be a locus from the Lord to get in a message to America. Think about a little virus. Now, Pastor, you're hitting close to home. But think about a little virus. We're still feeling the effects of a little bitty virus, aren't we, as a country, as a nation. Think about it, this microscopic little bacterial virus in nature that shut down the entire world. It's almost unthinkable, isn't it, until it's not. And God can use these little things to get our attention, to wake us up, to force us to take an honest look. Well, Pastor, what does that have to do with us today? What locust might God be using in your life to get your attention? How about in your family? Has everything that is near and dear and precious to you, is it being destroyed? Because I believe that the American family, we see an underroding of the American family that is near destruction. It's a field that's been passed over by the locusts. And so a harsh word this morning, but Joel begins to take an honest look at it. The second thing that he does is he takes a humble response to God's promises. See, God, he, he uses, Joel uses this invasion as an example and an illustration of what is to come. The people of Judah uh, could, could look and see literal devastation all around them. And then it's as if Joel turned to them and looked and said, hey, if you think this is bad, 
you haven't seen anything yet. If you think this is bad, you haven't seen anything yet. And then he tells them about the day of the Lord coming and the devastation that they would see from the locust doesn't compare to the devastation that is to come. He said this in uh, one fifteen. He said, Woe for the day, for the day of the Lord is near and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all of the habitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is near. Indeed, it is near. Chapter 2, verse 2, A day of darkness and gloom, a day of cloud and thickness and darkness. As dawn is spread over the mountain, so great and mighty people, there has never been anything like this, nor will there again after it for years of many generations. Verse 11 says, And the Lord uttered His voice before His army. His camp is indeed very great, for mighty is the one who carries out the word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and awesome, and who can endure it? Now, he had, he had to get their attention, right? And Joel would tell the people to stop looking around at the locusts and to start looking at what is ahead of them. This, this locust plague, plague symbolizing eventually what would be an army coming to evade them. Invade them. Joel chapter 1 verse 20 says, Even the animal of the field... Pant, pant for you for the streams bed the stream beds of water dried up and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness he is most likely referring to this Assyrian army that is that is coming after them during the reign of King Hezekiah which took place around 701 BC this is again giving us an idea of when Joel wrote this or, or when the Lord penned this book through Joel so God allowed the Assyrian army to ravage the land but miraculously delivered Jerusalem from being held captive. Twice in this passage, Joel tells them that the day of the Lord is near. If you're, if you're a writer in your Bible or a circler or underliner, underline those two because this is a very special period of time that God would, would, would be planning and directing that the Lord utters His voice before His army, and He says this, He says, It was God who brought the locust. I put this on the screen for you. It was God who brought the locust to the land, and God who would allow the Syrian army to invade the land. See, God used the locust to describe the soldier. Just as the locust had destroyed everything edible before them, the army would use a scorched earth policy and devastate the towns and the lands that were before them. And who was in charge of this invasion? He said, the Lord is. He said, it's the Lord that brought this, uh, that God would use even a pagan nation to accomplish His purpose on earth. And the awesome cosmic kind of disturbance described in Joel chapter 2 verse 10 are Joel's way of announcing that the Lord was in charge. It was like, hey, I want you to see this. God is going to do this. For these signs accompany the day of the Lord. Joel chapter 2, verse 10. Before the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon become dark, and the stars lose their brightness, the Lord utters His voice before His army. His camp is indeed great, for mighty is the one who carries out the work of the Lord. The word of the Lord. For the day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. And who can endure it? See, Joel is talking about the day of the Lord in kind of these ever-widening circles. First, he applies it to the locust. In a sense, it was the day of the Lord. And then he widens it a little bit further. And he talks about the invasion of the Assyrian army in Israel. And then he widens it a little bit further. And then he talks about the end of the earth or the, the day in which the Lord had not seen yet but the day in which the Lord comes and, and, and the earth ends and a time of judgment upon this earth and so he's saying church the locusts are coming the Lord is coming in Matthew chapter 24 Jesus predicted that there would be a great tribulation a, a time of universal widespread disaster a time described in Revelation chapter 6, verse chapter 6 through verse chapter 19. The day of the Lord, the great tribulation. 
is described in detail in times unimaginable, unbelievable, unthinkable horror. But yet he says that the day of the Lord is coming. And so he takes this honest look and and, and an honest look at what's going on, but then a humble response to the promises of God that, hey, this is temporary. The day of the Lord is coming. And then he had this heartfelt desire to see God work. You see, it's one thing to look around and see the brokenness and the devastation in the world and be sad or broken over it. But it's another thing to think about my heart in relationship to God who created me. And when considering the judgment of the coming of the Lord, Joel said this, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with your fasting, weeping, and mourning. He says, and tear your heart, not merely your garments, and now return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in mercy and relenting of catastrophe. Who knows he might turn and relent and leave a blessing from behind resulting in a grain offering and a drink offering from the Lord God. Blow a a trumpet in Zion, consecrate as a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the infant nursing, have the groom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chambers. Let the priest and the Lord's ministers weep before Uh, between the porch and the altar and let them say spare your people Lord and do not make your inheritance a disgrace with the nation jeering at them why should those among the people say where is their God and so Joel begins to give kind of from here we've taken a look at at, at this honest situation this holding on uh, to the promises of God and then this heartfelt desire to see God work and as God begins to work how does that flesh out what does that look like what does genuine repentance look like well we saw this in our text first it means to 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 turn from your sin in repentance I I love what that 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 uh, the picture of that literally that word repentance I, I love doing this I'm a, I'm a visual guy so I love fleshing things out but that word repentance in the original language literally means to be walking in one direction and as we cry out to God God forgive me I repent I turn from my sin and walk in an opposite direction Many times are we guilty? Hey, if I got one finger pointing at you, I got three pointing back at me. I'm not standing up here in a place of judgment. I'm not standing up here in a place of condemnation. I'm standing up here as a brother and just like you who struggles to walk in a broken and fallen world. I have my temptations and my struggles just like you. How many times do we find ourselves, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive forgive me, Lord. And we continue to walk in that way. But he says, turn from. He, he, he He gave this literal idea, God is imploring His people to return to me with all of your heart. One thing we know Real repentance, real repentance always involves turning away. Genuine repentance always involves leaving behind and going a different direction. And he says here, turn away from. You can have, hey, listen, we said this a minute ago, we're being real. We can have all the remorse and never change our ways. I'm not going to get an amen on that, but we know it to be true, right? We can have all the remorse and never turn and walk away. But genuine repentance, genuine repentance involves turning away from our sin. 
And he said this, he says, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, render your hearts and not your garments. Think about that for a minute. Lord, I'm going to lay this down for you. It's easy for me to come out of this jacket and lay it down. Hey, render more than your outside garments. Render your heart. God, I don't know how I'm going to get past this. God, I don't know what this is going to look like. God, this is going to be hard. God, this is going to be tough. But I'm going to lay this down for you. And I'm going to turn and walk away. And you know what? (laughs) In the act of, literally, I I can just imagine in the act of, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but Lord, I want to repent and turn around. And God, I need you to help me. I need you to, I need you to, oh, 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 okay. I, I need you to help me, Lord. He doesn't put a limit on the number of times we can call out to him and beg him and plead him for help. What is God saying? He says, man, I'm tired of your fake repentance. That's hard to say, isn't it? I'm tired of your fake repentance. You cry, you tear tear off your clothes, you sit in sackcloth and ash, but you never change. You never surrender. And he says, I'm ready for some torn hearts, not just torn garments. The second thing he says in in verses 13 and 14, he's talking about this trusting in the Lord and in His grace. So we said this just a minute ago, that real repentance means turning from our sin and trusting in Christ, that, that we're called to return to the Lord. And what's the motivation from turning on our sin and and trusting in Christ? What what does that look like? Because He can forgive us, right? That's the blessing out of it. I always I I, I use this quote a lot, but but I'm not saying that this is easy. Which it's a theologian. I, I I'm drawing a blank right now, but he said that. Is it Billy Sunday? He's a preacher and teacher. He said this. He said, The reason that sin flourishes in the world today, you guys have heard me say this before, especially if you've been in on Wednesday night. He said, The reason that sin flourishes in the world today is we treat it like a cream puff instead of like a rattlesnake curled up ready to strike. Think about that for a minute. For, for me, I mean, you know... I, Hey, you can probably tell I don't turn away a lot of desserts. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm less apt on a cream puff. But you, man, you put a fresh Holtz donut in front of me now and you're talking my kind of language. You fill in your Krispy Kreme, you fill in Dixie Cream, you fill in your 14-layer chocolate cake, you banana pudding, where's Mike at? He's not here today. You put your banana pudding, you put whatever it is. The reason that sin thrives, the reason that sin grows, the reason that sin is ever prevalent in our world and in our lives is because we treat it like that banana pudding, that chocolate cake, that Holtz donut, that whatever, instead of like a rattlesnake curled up ready to strike. I don't know about you. I see a plate of donuts over there. I'm a whole lot more apt to reach my hand over in there and grab it than I am. I see a snattle, rattlesnake curled up there, and I hear that. Woo! I'm running. I, you don't ever have to worry about your, your pastor being Pentecostal and handling snakes. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. But he says the reason that sin flourishes in the world is we treat it like this. And he's saying, and and what what I think Joel is telling them is that we need to trust in the grace and the mercy of our God. I I love that text. Um, uh, If you've got your Bible open, I didn't put this up here. But if you've got your Bible open, well, yeah, it's fine. I did put this up there. For he, he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Now return to the Lord, for He is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, verse 13. Slow to anger, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and mercy, relenting in catastrophe. Who knows, He might turn and relent and leave a blessing resulting in a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord. 
Real repentance means depending on God's grace for salvation, not on our own work or religious merit. Think about an old song that we used to sing. It says, Nothing in my hand I bring, only to thy cross do I cling. Right? I drop everything, all my sin, all my regret, as well as my empty religious works when I come to the cross of Christ. So he says, turn from your sin. He says, trust in the Lord for His grace. And thirdly, he says, tell others about His goodness. You see, there's one thing that that is almost certain to happen when repentance is real. You want others to know about how God changed your life. Hey, I want to I go tell somebody. I want to shout this from the mountaintop. Jesus has done this in my life. Jesus has changed me. Jesus has turned the direction of my life. God is doing something great in my life. You want to tell others about how God is changing you. And, and if you turn to Christ and place your trust in Him and trust in His grace, you will want to tell others about that experience. Uh, Joel said this. He said, blow a trumpet from Zion, right? He says, make it known, blow a trumpet from Zion, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather people together, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, the infants nursing, have a groom come out of his closet, a bride out of a bridal chamber, let the priest, the Lord's minister, weep between the porches and the altar and let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your inheritance a disgrace. For with the nation jeering at them, why should these Among you say, where is their God? In other words, gather everybody together and let them know that we serve a God who forgives our sin, who is faithful and just to remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. He is so good and He longs, church, to show us grace and to show us mercy. But He calls us to genuine, true Repentance. We can fake it to the world. We can think maybe in our own mind we can fake it before God, but guess what? We can't. And He's given us this recipe of what genuine repentance looks like. And so as the worship team makes their way forward, it's crazy for me to think that, man, we're coming up on 24 years ago right? 23 years ago, 23 years ago this September, 9-11. Kind of hard to believe. But I can still remember America in the weeks following September the 11th, 2001. For the first time in a long time, there were people searching for answers and there were people turning to God. I was blessed. I was serving I was uh, working for Clayton County Board of Education at the time, but I was serving as a, a youth leader in my home church. And, and, and I don't think I've ever seen the church more full than it was on September the 16th, 2001. That was the first Sunday after the terrorist attack on the Twin Towers, the Pentagon, and, Pen- and, and Pennsylvania. And this disaster caused many people to look to God. There was only one problem. It didn't last very long. Just a few weeks, people quit showing up for church. In another year or so, we went back to cursing God again. And instead of asking God to bless us, we were sad. We were sorry it happened, but it didn't change the heart of our nation. And what's sad is so often disasters like these reveal the soul of a nation, the heart of its people. And sadly, while we had change, we had a chance to return to God and trust in His grace, we gave an outward semblance of repentance without a change of heart. And that begs the question, at least in my mind, What will it take for us to turn to God in real, genuine, heartfelt repentance? Because this is what the Lord desires from us. You see, 
what is it? What is the old school saying? So you can you can take a pig, put makeup on it, put a dress on it, put high heels on it, put a little fur, furly stuff around its ears, make it look like. But at the end of the day, it's still just a pig. And and how many times are we guilty of doing that when it comes to our relationship with God? We put on the outside garments. Man, I'm in church, preacher. What are you talking to me about genuine repentance? I'm here. As I heard a guy say, he says, uh, standing in a garage makes you no more of a car being in a garage than a, yeah, whatever. You get it, right? But is it standing in a car makes, does not make you a, a car parked in a garage or something along those lines? I'm butchering it all up. Thank you all for grace. <laughs> Appreciate it. I should have wrote that down. No, I'm just kidding. But God calls us to genuine, true, heartfelt repentance. And I'm asking you a question this morning. Are you walking in that? Or are you masking it? Have you truly repented of Christ, repented and turned to Christ? Or are you trying to do it on your own? Walking like everybody else, but dressing up, trying to live out the parts on Sunday morning and blowing it the rest of the time. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Here in just a moment, the altar will be open. and Guys, maybe you're here this morning and you just need to get up from your seat here in a few moments. And you need to come down and commune, fellowship. Get on your face before a holy God. And, and I want to make a promise to you this morning. I've never done this before. But I believe that could apply to the young child. I believe that could apply to the senior adult in the room. And maybe you're here and you need to get that right. But Pastor, if I get down and I get down on my knees, I won't be able to get up. There are people here to help you. God calls us to surrender. God calls us to turn. God calls us to genuine repentance. Will you listen? Will you obey? Here in just a moment, the altar will be open. Will you do as the Spirit leads. Would you stand with me, please? Our Father, Lord, I just sense around the room that there are some people, Lord, that need to lay some things at your feet. They've been masking, they've been holding on to certain things. They come in, they tear the outer garment. But Lord, you are desiring for torn and broken hearts. Lord, would you speak to our hearts this morning? Would you help us to be obedient? And Lord, no matter where we find ourselves at this morning, maybe we're sitting in the pew, maybe we're serving in the sound booth, maybe we're listening in the mother's room or we're joining on line. Maybe we're standing up here in the praise team. Lord, if we have to go total silence in this room because every person in this room needs to come and get on their knees in the altar, Lord, we'll do that. For Lord, you desire true repentance. Lord, would you help us to lay things down here today? We're going to praise you, Lord, because you are worthy. Have your will, have your way. May we be obedient. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
word and just a lot of folks coming down this morning maybe you're here and you're like man I, I, I need to don't hold on to whatever it is you're holding on to surrender I don't I don't normally draw out a long sense of an emotional response I just sense in my heart maybe that there's somebody here that needs to come that needs to surrender we're gonna sing one more verse and we'll end our service time. But will you come? Will you be obedient? Will you step out?